Pop quiz. How many oysters do Americans eat each year? 200,000, 2 billion, 200 million, or 2 billion? Only 43% of Americans eat oysters. But that adds up to 2 billion oysters each year. But even if you don't eat oysters, these interesting creatures are making your world better. To find out how, we went to LSU's Oyster Hatchery and Research Facility on Grand Isle, Louisiana. Grand Isle is way down in Louisiana, but it was worth the drive. Let me introduce you to the two staff members who showed us around. This is Dr. Brian Callum. His master's degree and Ph.D. research involved oysters. He is now the director of the Oyster Research Lab. And this is Rissa Inselman. She is an Okie like me. Rissa told us that she knew she wanted to become a marine biologist since she was eight years old. Now that she is a marine biologist, she is a research associate at the lab in charge of growing algae. You are going to see more of that in a bit, and I think you will be surprised by what you see. But first, let's see the oyster cycle. This is, this describes every step of an oyster's life, and we have a hand in every step along the way. So we start out with adult oysters. Right now, all of our adult oysters are out in our research farm, which we'll see uh, in a little bit. Um, I brought some up on land because we're going to start bringing them into the hatchery today. So we, we start with our adult oysters, and that's where we're going to get our eggs from. And they release their eggs out into water. So if, it's kind of hard to tell in this picture, but it kind of looks like milky water there, right? It's kind of mm -hmm. cloudy a little bit. All of that cloudiness in the water where it looks like somebody spilled a little bit of milk in there are the eggs that the oysters just release out into the water. And that's what they do out in nature as well. They're called broadcast spawners. So that means they just broadcast everything out. And then this is under the microscope of eggs that have been fertilized. So these eggs are getting ready to hatch. Now, unlike chicken eggs, oyster eggs don't have a hard shell. They're soft and gooey. Um, and squishy. So instead of cracking open, that, cell, that egg cell just divides into two. And as it starts dividing, it keeps going and going and going, and you get swimming larvae. So this is the first larval stage of an oyster is called a trochophore, which is a real fancy word, but they have a little flagella, which is a little hair kind of thing that they wiggle back and forth, and that's how they swim through the water. When they're this size, they're still microscopic, so you can't see them yet. And they'll swim through the water, and after about 24 hours after the eggs hatched, they'll look like this, which is a veliger larvae. At this point, they have two shells already. So oysters are bivalves. So bi means two, and valve describes their shell. So they have two shells, and they look like this, and they have this little hairy, vellum that sticks out and all those hairs they wiggle those and that's how they swim around in the water and they'll they look like this and they'll swim around in the water for about two weeks after two weeks they get to their final larval stage which is called the petty veliger petty like pedicure means foot and veliger is describing the larvae so it's a, a foot larvae if you see this little tube that sticks out right there mm -hmm. so at the at the end of its larval part of its life cycle, it grows its foot. That foot has, it's like a nose with chemical receptors on it. So it swims down to the bottom and it feels around with their foot like this. And they're looking for something that smells really nice to them that they can glue themselves onto. Now, in the wild, oysters grow in clumps and stick to each other because they can't move, so they have to be close to other oysters if they want to make new oysters. So they're really good at smelling oysters. And if you look at this... I guess that's a spat. Yes. That's, nope, this one's not... That one doesn't have any on it. Okay, look at this tile. You see all these little specks on there? Mm -hmm. 
those are larvae that have attached themselves to this tile. Yeah, so they're this size. When they get to this point, that's two weeks old, you can start to see them. And they, they're about the size of a piece of sugar. And they glued themselves onto stuff. So we let them glue themselves onto this tile. But in nature, they glue themselves onto other oysters. And then, so you see all these little circles on there? Those are all the spat. Once they glue themselves to something, we don't call them larvae anymore, we call them spat. So all those little circles are spat. And these are all two months old on this big oyster shell here. See in there, just stick all over. Mm -hmm. And then as they continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger, you get um, real big um, complex shapes like this kind of thing right here. You guys check this out. So this is what, Come here, in, in nature, after all the oysters have stuck to each other and they start growing bigger and bigger, it looks like this. And this is what we call an oyster reef. Yeah. You call it an oyster what? Oyster reef. Reef. Yeah. So oyster reefs in nature are really important, not just because they give us places to collect oysters to eat from, but they serve as a habitat for other animals in the wild. Do you know what a habitat is? Oh. I don't re really remember. A place where animals live? Yeah, a place yeah. where you live. Yeah, I forgot. Right? Mm -hmm. So your habitat is your house in Oklahoma, right? Yes. An oyster's habitat is an oyster reef. And baby fish, they like to have a habitat that's safe for them so they don't get eaten by a bigger fish. Or well, a shark. Or a shark, or crabs, or bird, or people. So if you look at this reef, you can see there's like all kinds of little good hiding spots in here. If you were a fish that was this big, right, you could swim up under this shell and you'd be safe. Right? <laughs> yes. Now if you came out, something might eat you, but you can always run back in there and hide until you were big enough that you were going to start eating some of the fish. And get eaten by shark right. too. And also eaten by the person. So that's why oysters are really important for the ecosystem and for nature. They also one thing that they do help with is if you have a big storm that's coming in with a lot of waves. When you guys drove in, you might have seen some of the waves crashing on the rocks on the side of the road, right? Well, oyster reefs can get big enough where those waves will crash onto the oyster reef instead of on the land, and it won't wash the land away as much. So it can help protect land from being washed away in a big storm or something comes through. Now that we know about their life cycle, I have another question. What do oysters eat? Oysters eat algae, single-celled microalgae. And we actually have some that we grow here in our hatchery. So come on here and you can see what it looks like. So algae are like plants. So they photosynthesize, which means they turn sunlight into energy and they produce oxygen. Just like plants that we eat, like lettuce and broccoli. Um, the only difference is the type of algae that oysters eat are all single celled, so they're microscopic one cells. And the gills on an oyster that they use for breathing uh, have small holes, so it's like a net. And they pump water across their gills, and those little cells come and they stick to their gills. And then they move that food up to their mouth, so they filter feed. So for our hatchery, we grow all of the food for the oysters that we grow in our fish tanks. And it all starts in this room here. Come on in, just don't touch anything because we'll keep it nice and clean. But if you come down here, this is what algae looks like. This is why ocean water and river water and bay water are brown and green because of algae that's growing in the water. Mm -hmm. So we start here with these little test tubes that have tiny little amount of algae cells floating around in that water. And into that water, we put in some plant food, which is like miracle work. We make up our own formula with some chemicals that we have here. That's all the nutrition that plants need to grow. And then the algae cells start growing and dividing, and there's more and more algae in the little tube. So we move it to a larger flask with more seawater and more food for the algae to, to use to grow. And so these are new, so you can see they're they're pretty clear, it doesn't look like much is in there. But if you look at the ones down here, they're a little bit darker. 
so there's more algae in there. And then as that gets darker, we move into larger flasks with more water and more nutrients, and what more it, vitamins. What are these percentages? That... So the percentages are uh, how much salt is in the water. Where we are, we're close enough to the Mississippi River that we get a lot of fresh water from time to time. And algae, the algae that we're growing are sensitive to quick changes in how much salt is in the water. So we run parallel cultures of algae at different salinities so that if the water we're drawing in changes quickly, um, it's not a shock to one of them. And so you can see like these, you know, it looks like sweet tea. So that one's ready to go into a bigger flask. And it's all just slowly bringing it larger and larger volumes of water. The reason we put a, we slowly transition them to larger and larger volumes of water is we don't want to dilute them too much. So if there's not enough algae in the flask and it's any clearer than that, it's too much light gets on them and they basically get a sunburn and it damages the algae and kills the plants. So we bring them up slowly. Um, that also makes sure that they stay clean. And we grow a couple different types of algae and the algae types are chosen on nutritional content. So we have some that have a lot of proteins, some that have, you know, they're more fatty. So to get a well-balanced diet for the oysters that we're growing. Wow, I'm... and you said they're all single cell. They're all single cell. But yeah. not all algae are single cell. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, and they started way back here with this sample, did it? Yeah. yeah, so we get these test tubes from um, uh, a NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Association Laboratory in Milford, Connecticut. They have a massive collection of different algae species that they do lots of research on. So they send us, we order it, they have a catalog. We say we want these couple types and they'll send us a little vial of them. And then we just kick off the whole process from those. How many different? We have types? five different types. Okay. Two two main types, and then five sort of strains out of those two main types. So, and do you always have to start with that, or once you grow them so far, you can take a little bit and re? You can take a little okay. bit. Yeah. Um, the past couple of years, once we get a culture of algae going through that's doing really well, we just keep reusing that to start new ones off. Uh, but after the hurricane, we lost everything, so we had to start over again this year. And lost everything because the power went out. Because the power went out, yeah. It was, you know, 100 degrees in here. And you're, so what things do you have to do to keep them alive? You have to keep the temperature? Temperature? So each of these is one species of algae, and there's nothing else in this container other than that one species, that one type of algae. So we keep it cold in here because that slows down bacteria from growing. We don't want bacteria to get in there. That's also why you can see there we have air bubbling through, but it passes through a filter first. So we filter even the air that's going in because you know there's dust and bacteria and germs in the air. We don't want any of that getting into those either. Um, so we keep it cool in here. We sterilize everything before we use it, either with UV light or high temperature, high pressure sterilizing equipment that we have. That, is that what this is? A UV light That's sterilizer? UV light, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I also put the chair too. The chair, or the chair's, chair's probably fine. Okay. Yeah. Chair's nothing, there's nothing wrong with the chair. Right. Um, because these are plants and they photosynthesize, plants use carbon dioxide, you know, stuff that we breathe out to, to photosynthesize and make oxygen. So to help speed up how much photosynthesis this algae is doing, they're being aerated, but we're also injecting carbon dioxide. So we have a big tank over there of carbon dioxide gas that we add to the air that feeds all the rest of the water. So that they can get as much carbon dioxide as they need to do as much photosynthesis as possible and grow food. And we also have the fun colored lights so the, the color of the lights are chosen not just because they're fun to look at, but you have different types of algaes are different colors. So, you know, most plants we see green, but some plants, you know, their leaves might be purple or a little bit browner. Depending on the color of that leaf or the algae cells, 
they use different colors of light to photosynthesize well. So we've chosen these colors because we mainly have brown algaes, um, and some are a couple different shades of brown. Um, so the blue and the red and this yellow uh, target the colors of light that they can use most efficiently for that photosynthesis. So, so we start down there, and they keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. As, does that mean these are in our final? This is the final for the beginning phase. Oh, just the, yeah. it's, just the it's end only of phase. Gets, yeah. It gets this big. So after that stop room, they come to our algae production room. This is where we really scale up how much food we're producing for the oysters. Okay, come on in. Oh, look at those lights. Chris, I have a confession. Yeah. When Dr. Brian told me that, oh, you're the algae growing specialist, yeah. I thought, I grew out. <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> it, it was an eye opening experience for me as well. Um, I didn't know that so much went into making. I'm putting algae from this in here, but I didn't realize that there's so much science that goes into raising algae and culturing it. So this is really the building block. If we want to have baby oyster larvae, we've got to have a lot of fiber points and a lot of algae. Baby oyster. Bring a a friend rock flap, this guy, this big guy, into our bag. So this this algae here is about three weeks old, and then it gets put in these bags, and it gets constantly dripped with water. Slowly adding the filtered seawater keeps the reproduction rate higher and avoids the sunburn effect described earlier. Or if you kind of blast them with that water, it slows their growth down quite a bit, like almost to the point where we've had crashes and the algae will die. And if you, it's, they're kind of finicky where you have to baby them a little bit. So, and I think you just said, but I was focused a little too much on that. So how long will it take to fill the bag? Anywhere, just depending on the color, the density of the algae. Um, a, darker, a, dar a darker fern starting out will probably be harvesting in seven to ten days. Whereas something lighter, maybe like this color of a bag or something like that. This color may be compared to something dark like this. This may take closer to two weeks before we're harvesting it and it's up to like this height in the bag. But these guys were put up um, February 19th and they reached this this height um, on Monday. So up roughly seven to ten days, something like that. Sometimes uh, since we're just getting this room started back up, we kind of start off slow and let, let it um, ramp up where we can't open that room up and give them more water when they are reproducing more and it's just filtered seawater is coming through that. Yep. The seawater filling the bags comes from the bay right outside. It goes through filters and food for the algae is added to it. Yep. And those two containers right in front of you, are, these are our nutrients and silica. That's what our algae eats. It doesn't look too appetizing. It's a nasty yellow color. Um, kind of nutrient? What are we talking about? Um, just a lot of it is, most of that is chelated iron, um, some trace metals, and other carbon, uh, organic carbon inputs. That Stuff they would naturally find out there. Yeah. It's very similar to what we have period in our nutrients is very similar to what is found in the water. When the bags are ready, they go into these tanks. From here, it can be delivered to the oysters by bucket or pumps. If you notice, you know, it's kind of wiggling around over there. We have a little little mixer at the bottom to keep it stirred up. Otherwise, all the algae would just settle out to the bottom. Okay. So we keep it mixed up nice and gentle. This is the room where the oysters are grown. We don't have any in here now, unfortunately. Um, this system is on. This is what we're going to bring in the adult nothing in there now, um, but this is where we're going to put them in, this is an insulated tank, 
and it's hooked up to these big air conditioner units so that we can raise and lower the temperature in here. Um, so we're going to bring oysters in, raise the temperature up, and feed them a ton to get them ready for spawning. Um, in the summertime, when oysters that are out on our farm are already ready for spawning, we're going to bring them in and lower the temperature, and that stops them from spawning until we're ready for that to happen. So about how many oysters will you put in? Um, we put maybe, maybe a thousand oysters in this tank and a thousand on the other side. And we've got one more on the other side of the tank as well. And lots of dumb questions. Are there boy oysters and girl oysters or? Yeah, there are. Um, but oysters are also, um, they're pro-candric hermaphrodites. So they all start off as males. And then sometimes some of them, for some reason, will switch and become females. Um, it's pretty interesting. In the wintertime, when it's cold, they all become dormant, and you can't tell if it's a male or a female at all. And that's when the switching happens. So there's some way that the oysters are able to tell if there's not enough females around. And if that's the case, some of the males will switch. Um, so yeah, okay. It's not just an accident. It's no, part of their balance yeah. thing. And will they just switch once, or they can go back and forth? Usually, board? it's just one way. Um, there's been a couple people that have said they've seen them go back, but usually, once they become female, that's it. They stay that way. And how long does an oyster live? If nothing eats it and a disease doesn't kill it, it can live. You know eight or ten years. That would be doing pretty well. And from the time, how old do they have to be when they can start reproducing? In their first year. First year. Yeah. I've seen oysters that you know, are as big as a dime that have sperm and eggs. How many eggs do they produce? The one, they're broadcasting them. How many yeah, eggs? Yeah, it depends on the size. So bigger oysters are going to have more eggs. But, you know, a three-inch typical sized oyster that you get at a restaurant can put out anywhere from, you know, a couple million to 40 or 50 million eggs. Because I, I take it, they, it's just a numbers game. It is, yeah. Yeah, so they, they make a lot of low quality eggs and then shoot them out and hope some of them get fertilized and then hope some of those survive. So there's a lot of attrition. Can you tell an oyster's age by the size or a ring? Um, there, there are layers in the shells, um, but down here where it's pretty warm for most of the year, it's hard to tell that way how old an oyster is. Um, but oysters in places with really short growing seasons, like in Maine or Washington or Alaska, it's a little bit easier to to measure growth and age that way. Like growth rings almost. Yeah, like growth rings, yeah. You know, because in, in Alaska, they might grow for two months or three months of the year, and then the rest of the time, they're just hanging out. Growing oysters is an intensive process. This here, that black sand, those are the oyster larvae that are on a, a really fine mesh screen. You know, something like this like this kind of fine mesh here. So we use really fine mesh screens like this uh, to drain our tanks. So every day or every other day, we'll drain all the water out of one of these larvae tanks, collect all the larvae on the screen, clean the tank, put new clean filtered seawater in there, new algae, and then dump all the larvae back in. Every day. Every day or every other day. At this point, you may be wondering why they grow oysters. We produce oysters here for two main reasons. The first is to provide oysters for the commercial oyster farming industry to use and grow on their farms and cages. And to do that, when the larvae have their foot organ and are ready to glue themselves to something, um, we want them to, to not form clusters and, and reef like they would in nature. We want single individual oysters because that looks prettier on a restaurant plate and that's who they're targeting as their customers. I got you. So to do that, 
we don't let the oysters attach to other oysters. We take this really fine sand, which is made out of crushed up oyster shells. Hey, buddy, you're gonna hold a little bit in your hand. You set that down. So that's crushed up oyster shells. So the idea here is that each tiny little particle is big enough that one oyster larvae can glue itself to. That way they're single, they're not stuck together. And then when you grow them on your farm, there's not clumps you're having to pull apart, which is a lot of work. And because they're single, they'll all more or less have the same shape and they can grow at the same rate, so they'll be the same size. Um, you have consistency and everybody's the same. Because that's important when you're selling a food product is to have everything coming up together and the same quality across the board. So that size is not accidental. If it, it's right. too big, you would have... You'd have more than one. If it's too small, they're just going to set to each other instead. Yeah, so this is specifically chosen. Um, you don't have to remember that size off the top of your head, do you? It's, we use a 250 micron screen to, to patch it. But anything smaller than that washes out, and we use a larger one, slightly larger, to take off the big stuff. The other main use of the oysters from our facility and operation here is for restoration work. So we're restoring some of the, the wild oyster populations that we have in Louisiana. So for those, we're putting those oysters directly on the bottom, out in the wild, not in cages. So we're building up new oyster reefs out there. So for that, we don't want to use the crushed up oyster shell, because then they're single and they're vulnerable predators. So for that activity, we fill up a tank with whole oyster shells that we either buy or we get from some partners that operate a sh an oyster shell recycling program. Um, where they go around to restaurants and they collect all of the used oyster shells, you know, from the raw bars or the you know, char grill places or wherever. And they collect those shells back, we bring them here, put them in a tank, and let our oyster larvae attach to it. And then those get transported out to the water and put out onto an oyster reef to help bolster that population that's out there. Okay, so let's back up to the person for just a second. Those are for farms, just Louisiana farms, or they go to farms all over? Or? Both. Um, we prioritize Louisiana farms first because it's a state-funded facility. Um, but once everybody in Louisiana has been satisfied with the amount of oysters that they want for their farms, if we have extra for many of our other activities, we open that up to the rest of the region. For right now, it's limited to the Gulf because of importation regulations for the other coasts. Um, so, any any growth and expansion of oyster aquaculture, not just in the Gulf of Mexico, but anywhere in the U.S., builds the market and benefits oyster farmers in Louisiana. So that's why, we, even though it's state tax funded, we still help out people around us. And on the second one, where you were uh, adding to restoring reefs, that's all. In Louisiana. How does that get decided where they go and how much? So we we work with our partners at the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries. They manage all of the freshwater and marine fisheries, which includes the oyster fishery. So part of their management strategy is rehabilitating those reefs that are going to be fished on later. So they choose the sites. We produce the oysters and put them on the oyster shell and then we work with them to transport them out wherever they've designated it's going to go. So, break down, how much is half and half, or? Um, most of it is restoration of, of natural reefs. Of most of the ones you produce go yeah. to restoration. Okay. Um, and then the farms, if they're not getting their baby oysters from you, do they get them as spat at that? What do I call them? Call them baby oysters. Yeah, what do they spat, actually get? Okay. Spat or seed. Okay. If they After don't... larvae, once they've attached to something, uh, for about the first week we call them spat, and then after that, when they're still small but 
not eating size, we call them seed. So, if they're not getting their seed from you, I mean, do they have do they have some that naturally reproduce? Do they have their own setups? Or? There's a, there is a commercial hatchery in Louisiana that's coming online uh, and produced oysters uh, the past two years. So they're getting established and 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 will be supplying the industry more and more as as they scale up their operation. Our goal is that the commercial sector will take over that part of the business as well. Okay. And then we can focus in on restoration and rehabilitation of the wild oyster rock. They're so small. Is it is there a number you can put to how many oysters you Yeah, we try to produce half a billion oysters a year. Half a billion? Half a billion, yeah. Five hundred million um, seed coming out. Uh, and a small portion of that goes to the, the oyster aquaculture farms in Louisiana. There's about 10 right now in a various states of operation because of the, the recent hurricanes we've had. So the demand for a seed going into a caged oyster aquaculture farm is pretty low right now in Louisiana. But that sector of the industry is growing rapidly. Okay. So the demand is going to increase, and that's why we're now seeing a commercial hatchery developing, because that, that demand is finally catching up where somebody's willing to invest in a really expensive operation. Yeah. In, yeah the power bill alone, you know. Yeah. So the seed that goes to an oyster farm is into a basket. Tell me a little bit about, I mean, I think of a basket that's, well, how do they go, stay? Oh, we're going to see. Outside. Okay. outside the lab is the residence where the staff stay when they are on shift. The porch overlooks the research farm. Oh. Yeah, so you can see there's a little bit of damage. And railing is messed up. Yeah. Considering that the roof is still on, yeah. it's pretty good. We noticed that once yeah. the roof was gone, it looked like it was all downhill after that. Yeah, and our pier got a little bit messed up. Um, but I wanted you guys to see it. see much because everything's down under the water surface. Um, but this farming system that you see with all these posts sticking up is called an adjustable long line system. And long line, so there's a long cable that runs down the length of each of these long rows. And it's adjustable because if you look in close on the, the posts, there's little black sort of bumps on there. Those are clips. So you can adjust how high up the oysters are and the reason that we do that is um, we have a lot of growth in Louisiana. It's so warm and there's so many nutrients in the water that we get a lot of what we call biofound, which just means living things that grow where you don't want them to grow. Um, so algae, barnacles, other oysters will grow on all of the stuff. Once it's been in the water for a couple days, it will start having stuff grow on it. We grow our oysters in mesh cages and mesh baskets, and we want to keep that mesh clear so that water can flow through, because that water is delivering algae to the oysters in our baskets. So if it gets clogged up, there's no flow happening and there's no food getting to our oysters. So we have the clips, we can raise them up and air dry them for a few hours or overnight, and that'll kill a lot of the algae and stuff that's growing on it, it'll dry it out and then we can put them back in the water. Because when the oysters come out of the water, they just close their shell, and they're fine for a while. And then when they get back in the water, they open the shell back up, and they're happy. How long could they be okay out of the water? It depends on the temperature, but in the summertime, when we dry them, we'll typically take them out of the water in the afternoon, and then the next morning, we'll put them back in the water. Um, but in the wintertime, as long as it's not too cold, uh, you can leave them out for you know a day or two. In some of the places where they get a lot of sea ice, like in Maine, for example, um, where they have sea ice that comes in and will cover up their entire farm, they'll take all the oysters out of their farm before, you know, just before the ice starts coming in and put it in uh, an ice cellar until spring. And then they'll bring them back out with 
very little of the oysters die. It's so cold and they just yeah, go they just dormant. Up and they go dormant and they're, and they're pretty okay. So, you know, oysters live close to shore in a lot of places, so if the tide goes down, they're exposed. So, you know, that's part of their life strategy is being able to close up and, and hang out for a while. It's also how they avoid getting eaten by a lot of stuff. This bag of oyster seed died in the hurricane power outage. So these are just the shells. This is about the size the oysters are when the farmers receive them. They go into growing baskets with mesh small enough to contain them. This is what I, this is a bigger mesh size. They're older, but we have some that you know, are a lot smaller. These are the baskets that hang on the adjustable long line system. So you can see these little clips. So we just clip it onto the cable and they sit down in the water. So when you raise them, are you raising lower each basket or you're no, lowering the whole cable? Yeah. So between the posts, like between the white posts, we'll have three or four of these baskets. So we'll just walk down the line to the post at the bottom. We brought in an oyster to get a closer look. Well, even though these didn't form a reef, there's lots of stuff that still lives around them. So oyster aquaculture is still good for helping other things out that live in the water. And if you look close, you can see a little worm crawling across the top there. Oh. Look, buddy, you see that worm? Are you looking for the GoPro? Is that what you're doing? Mm -hmm. You want to film it too? Okay. Oh. So this was one of the oysters you got out this morning? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this worm is actually not super great for oysters. They burrow into the shell um, and those burrows fill up with mud and create mud blisters on the inside. And that's not good. It stresses the oyster out because they have to put down, they have to grow extra shell to kind of cover it up. But also if, if it's an oyster destined to be eaten, if you shuck it open and you accidentally break open one of those mud blisters, it's really nasty smelling mud that comes out of it. And then you don't want to eat that. Yeah. It, it's encapsulated. So if, yeah. if you didn't bust it open. Yeah. So, is there anything, I mean, is it a big enough problem where they have to try to mitigate it somehow? Some places. Part of what we do here is also breeding. So we try to breed the oysters to just grow fast enough that they don't have to worry about that kind of stuff before it's a problem. You're already harvesting them and taking them out. So how long from the time you put them in as seed that they could be harvested? Uh, within a year. For the, the ones that we've selectively bred. Uh, wild oysters, especially if they're on the bottom and not in cages, can be closer to two years here. Okay, and is that a difference in their their habitat, or is there a difference? In yeah, the, in the food species? availability, okay. really. Okay. It's, yeah, so we only have one species. It's just some we've bred for faster growing, and then you know some we still use just wild oysters. Okay, so this is all about an oyster. So an oyster has two shells. Um, a top shell and a bottom shell, and it meets along this midline. If you look at it, it's kind of a teardrop shape. The point of the teardrop shape is the hinge where it articulates on, and this big broad side is the bill. So the, most of the growth happens on the bill side. And the way that oysters grow their shell is by secreting a, a mucus that comes out the front and then they incorporate um, minerals from the seawater into that and it hardens into a shell. So they're somehow able to pull um, calcium and magnesium out of the stuff that makes salt water salty out and harden that mucus up into a really hard shell. Okay. So. There's two ways people shuck. One is by going through the hinge. Another way is by going into the bill. Um, the adductor muscle that holds the shells together is right here. Um, I've never been good at going through the bill, but the people that do like speed shucking competitions usually go through the bill. So, yeah, you see how the shell is breaking apart? <clears throat> That's because of those worms. Yeah, see, look, there's even worms in the pieces right there. So this one that has the worms, it probably all in the basket will probably have. Yeah. Them. 
These are pretty old. These are at least two or three years old. Stubborn one. <laughs> okay, so it popped open there. Okay. Go for a start recording. Okay, there we go. So as you were slicing along a little bit, you were just kind of... Yeah. If you actually look here, this clear sack, that's its heart. If you look close, you'll see it beat a couple of times. That's its heart. Okay. Um, oysters have clear blood and an open no, circulatory system. So most of the blood is in the adductor muscle, which is this part here. Um, and that's what they used to hold their shell closed with. So most of that blood now is just coming out and it'll stop beating in a second. Um, the black hairs along the front edge are um, like little feelers. So if you touch them, it kind of retracts a little bit. Oh, yeah. See how it's pulling back? Right. So that's what it uses if a crab or something is coming along and starts to snip at it to eat it. It'll feel that and it'll close its shell up. Um, the adductor muscle it has two different colors, so like kind of a clear and then a real opaque part. So it's two different sort of muscle fiber types, like a slow twitch and a fast twitch muscle. So half of the muscle it uses if it needs to snap closed real quick because a crab came along. The other half is really good at staying flexed for a long time so it can keep that shell closed for a long period of time. Okay. What book? You can record anything you want. Now you might fill up the card or run out of battery, but that's okay. Yeah. Can you flip them back over for just a second? When you were saying the clear part was the heart, I was looking at the... Oh, muscle. okay. Right yeah, that there. sack right there. That part's the heart. Right yeah. There. Oh, okay. That movement? Oh, yeah, it's still going. Yeah, look at that. Okay. Yeah. So oysters are, are kind of like onions. They have layers to it is how their body is organized. The top layer, it's the same on, <clears throat> on the back side of this too, like the underside. So this top layer is the mantle. That's what it uses to make its shell with. Um, if you flip the mantle back, at least along this edge, this is the gills here. Okay. So here's the gills. Let's and you, take a look at that, buddy. You can see those lines? Right? Yeah, if you look close, you can see it's got a bunch of lines on it. So the, it's actually kind of wavy in the gills. Um, and that's to increase the surface area. So it, it like folds them up. Um, and it's got a few layers of them flapped over, but you can see there's mud and stuff in there. So it's pretty windy out today. So a lot of stuff is mixed up in the water and this was just out there filtering. So it, a lot of that mud was getting mixed up because it's so wavy and choppy um, that it, it was filtering out some mud. Um, and when it, it has hairs all on the gills, so it'll move all these particles up here towards its mouth. Um, and it's got a couple more folds of tissues up here um, that also have hairs on it. And that's where it does its selection process on whether or not it's gonna actually swallow something. Um, and, or it'll bundle it up in mucus and send it out as, we call it pseudo feces because it looks like feces, but it's not digested. Um, or it'll swallow it and it'll go down into its gut. And then it'll sit in its gut, get digested, and then uh, the rectum's over here, and it just spits it out the other side of the shell. That amazes me that it's that selective. What what makes it say, yeah, this is good to eat, and this is not? We're not sure. Um, there's It has chemical receptors like your tongue, so it can taste whatever is on the outside of an algae cell. It can taste this is an algae, and it'll eat it. Um, if it's mud, it can taste... This doesn't taste very good. 
and kick it out. It's also, you know, its mouth is only a certain size too. So if a particle is too big, it won't try to sw it won't try to put it into the mouth because it knows it's too big. It can feel like it's too big. Um, so let's see. Oops, spray you. Um, no. Yeah. So one, once you open them up like this, then they die within yeah. minutes. Minute, yeah. Um, it actually kills them if they don't open up like that. Yeah, actually. So see how it's kind of... Yeah. The, the loss of blood. The blood. loss, yeah. Um, so see how it's kind of lumpy right here? Yep. That's some of the gonad that's starting to form. Okay. Um, it's nice and fat, plump, and meaty looking. And that's just fat stored up as energy reserves that it has. And now it's starting to convert those into gonad, which is why it's starting to get this little lump here. So that lump, the whole thing will start to get real lumpy um, as it develops its gonad as the water continues to warm up outside. So are we looking at a male or a female? Don't know yet. Okay. Um, it probably hasn't formed sperm or eggs yet, so that's you can't the way tell. You can and that's the only way you can tell. You can't tell by looking at the shell on the outside, so you either have to wait for them to start spawning on their own um, it's easy to tell when they spawn. I can show you a video of it. Um, females, when they release their eggs, they do like a clapping kind of thing. So they fill up inside the shell cavity with the eggs and then they kind of clap the water and it puffs it out and spits them upwards. Um, the male is just release a stream out and it looks like skim milk or something coming out the side. Um, so you can tell by that behavior, but otherwise, yeah, we have to so, scoop out a little bit and look at it under a microscope to okay. see. So win winter time wouldn't know at all. Right. Close to spawning time. Yeah. Only when you see them spawn or you could tell then by looking. Oh, um, if you see sperm or eggs there. Yeah, okay. so if you shuck it open and sacrifice it, we could take, we could scrape a little bit. There's none in there now, I'm sure. But if it had some, we could scrape it and look at it under the microscope. And if you see, you know, it looks like white noise if it's male. Um, but the eggs are large enough, you can actually see the individual eggs. Like, that picture we saw. Um, so inside here is its gut. So that's the inside of the oyster. Get it to stand up without mashing it up. So you know the gut is brown and green colored because it eats algae. So that's all that's in there. Um, this is cool if I can get it out. Oh, I lost it. Yeah, there we go. Okay, you see this like clear tubey yeah. thing? Mm -hmm. This is, Look, this clear tube here is called a stylus. Do you know what a mortar and pestle are? Have you seen that before? No. Mom grinds up some places. A bowl, yeah, and you go and grind stuff up. Well, oysters eat plants, the algae, and they can be kind of tough. There's cell walls on some of them. So oysters grow this little stylus that we call it, but it's really a mortar and pestle. They have a, a sack inside their stomach, a little blind pouch that that sticks into and just grinds away at the algae to break it apart so they can digest it better. Wow. So that, that's one way you can tell how healthy an oyster is if they have a really big stylus on the inside. So um, how would you size it, this one? That one's okay. You can just average. Yeah. But it's also nice and plump, meaty looking. That That's a good sign. It smells good, which is always nice. Or it doesn't smell bad, I should say. Um, and after they spawn, like, you see how like it's meaty. You can't see through it at all. After they spawn, um, basically, well, right before they spawn, their whole body is going at pretty much. So once they spawn, everything's been released. And... The whole thing is almost transparent and just like a sack of water you can see through it it's pretty incredible um and you just let everything go so that's a good looking oyster we ask about the old rule of thumb about only eating oysters in months with r's in them dr callum explained that guideline was before modern refrigeration and no longer applies so you can eat oysters any time of the year um, and the reason for that is refrigeration. For example, in Louisiana, during the summertime when it's hot, we have uh, a rule that says by the, you have one hour from taking an oyster out of the water before it has to be 
at temperature under a mechanical refrigerator. So not just in an ice chest with ice, but in an actual refrigerator at the proper storage temperature within an hour of the oyster being out of the water. So it's pretty strict and that ensures that no matter how hot it is outside, the food that's coming out is safe that's going to be eaten. I never would have guessed there was so much to know about oysters. Lots of people love to eat them, and they are a healthy and sustainable source of protein. But even for those that don't eat them, oysters provide lots of benefits to our environment. Their reefs provide protection for other animals and provide erosion control. They filter water, cleaning up to 50 gallons per day. And they are an important and growing part of our economy. Thank you, Brian and Rissa, for showing us around. I learned lots about oysters, and I got to see how all of those science terms I have been learning are used by real scientists in their everyday work. See you on our next adventure!